because, you know, there's that uh, American <laughs> proverb, actions speak louder than words. And you have some friends who, they, they'll talk all the time about being there for you, but when you need them, they're nowhere to be found. And then you have some friends who never said a word, but they show up in your time of need. That's really what it uh, speaks to. And, uh, and now we're in that fascinating season where politicians are saying all kinds of things. So I just encourage you to look at their actions, you know. And, uh, yeah. Start at 16. But don't look at it for too long. It's depressing. Mm. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. So today we are, we are looking at Luke chapter 4. Um, we're going to look at verses 16 through 30. And there's a couple of theme verses that um, God has just really been impressing on me a lot as we go through this series. The first one is 1 John 3, 8. 1 John 3, 8 says this, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Some of you have seen the works of the devil this week. Just know Jesus came to destroy what the devil is doing. And what are the works of the devil? They're listed in, the, in John 10.10. 10. He came to steal and kill and destroy. So when you see individuals, when you see political groups, when you see nations whose policy is to steal and kill and destroy, just understand who their motivation is. Because there are, there are people who are just waiting for an excuse to destroy something. People will come, you know, torture your car and throw bricks through your window and they feel like if they just say the phrase, free Palestine, that makes it all okay. And then 1 John 3, 18 says this, Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Heavenly Father, as we look to your word today, we invite you to make it alive and active in our hearts. Lord Jesus, we want to see what you did. Because you said some mind-blowing things such as we would do even greater works than these. And Lord, that's difficult for us to imagine. But your word says that you do exceedingly abundantly more than all we could hope for or imagine. So Lord, we look to you today and we invite you to teach us how to take your actions and Lord, we ask you for the courage to step forward to take your actions. And Lord, if we're afraid, we actually invite you to give us a push in the right direction. Yes. Because there are a lot of days where we all need a push. Push us today with your word, we ask in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Luke chapter 4, starting with verse 16, it says this, Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me, to pre proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, 
Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. In other words, to Gentile territory. Mm -hmm. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. A couple of verses ago, they all thought well of him, right? <laughs> yeah, there's politics for you. <laughs> Going on, verse 29. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. It's stunning to me, and, and, and this section has captivated me. When Jesus read from Isaiah, he read from Isaiah 61. You might want to read it sometime. What did Jesus do here? He announced his calling. When he said, the Spirit of the Lord is, an, is upon me and has anointed me, we read about it a couple of weeks ago when Jesus was baptized and the Spirit descended on him like a dove. And Je so Jesus announced his calling. Apparently, they weren't all that excited about his calling. I mean, how stunning is it that he says, Isaiah prophesied this hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and this prophecy is fulfilled right here, right now, today, and you all get to see it. And their response was, what? Where... Where's all the background music? Where's the sparks and flames, right? <laughs> aren't you Joseph's son? We know. You were raised here. You aren't all that special, right? You ever been told that? Mm -hmm. How did Jesus say he was going to do these things? Because the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. In Acts chapter 2, when they asked the disciples, what should we do? He said, repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if you have, and, and the word repent doesn't mean feel really guilty. Okay, you need to let that go. That was, you know, your grandma telling you that or something. But <laughs> lots of people are coming to mind, sorry. <laughs> but the... the <laughs> We had a rosary in here yesterday. yesterday. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the word repent just means change your thinking. Decide that instead of the devil having the best deal, Jesus has the best deal. That's how you repent. You change your thinking. Make the decision, come hell or high water, Jesus has the best deal for me. And I will commit to him. That's repentance. That's choosing to give your life to Jesus and follow him. And, and the disciples said, if you do that, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will enable you the same way the Holy Spirit enabled Jesus, which is just kind of a mind-blowing thing to consider. Not long ago, an, another pastor pointed out to me the difference between having the potential and having a calling. And right now, this generation runs their kids ragged, wanting to find their potential. We'll take you to art class, and from there, we'll go to soccer, we'll swing through McDonald's drive through and then you'll go to this, 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 and this. Because <laughs> they're trying to find the magic thing, unlock what's hidden in them, this magic potential. Because, you know, they could be a classic piano player, so why are we taking them to football practice <laughs> or vice versa, you know? And the kids are like, Jesus said, come to me and 
I will give you rest. That's all I want. Can I sleep in on a Saturday? And then later we beg our kids the same thing. <laughs> your potential is something you might be good at. Your calling is something that the Spirit of God is enabling you to do. There's a big difference. There is a calling of God on your life. And God will give you opportunities to do it. You'll like doing it. And you will be good at it. And the great thing is, you don't have to go into seclusion for three weeks praying to try to find it. Uh, something I like to say here, God's ability to get through to me is greater than my ability to be dense. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're open to it, as long as you are trying to follow Jesus, Jesus is more than capable of unfolding his calling on your life before you. And some of you may be kind of freaking out, I can't do the stuff Pastor Kevin does. It's like, well, praise God, you can do stuff I can't. Because, like, like for instance, our, our homeless barbecue we're having here on, on uh, well, tomorrow. I can sit down, I can talk to people, I can talk about you know, where God has, has shown his love for these folks and stuff like that. But if I were setting up and decorating the tables, it would be the Spirit of God hovering over the chaos, basically. <laughs> it would, uh, yeah, you're like, ah, oh, these people, you know, some of their camps look better than this. <laughs> yeah. And yet, some of you, God has gifted you brilliant with form and color, and you are using it to the glory of God, and you make things beautiful. We all have different callings. But the best way to find your calling is to follow Jesus and step into his God-given opportunities. And people are like, oh, but isn't that a waste of potential? No, it's a waste of a life. If you are trying to explore something that randomly happened in your DNA versus the one who wove you together with your DNA. Simon Peter had a lot of potential as a fisherman, but his calling was to be a disciple with Jesus. And Jesus used him to change the world. Matthew or Levi had a lot of potential with numbers and finance, but his calling was to be a disciple and write one of the Gospels for us to be able to read. Simon the Zealot had potential as with military special forces and counterterrorism. But his calling was to be a disciple and follow Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Mary had potential to be a godly wife, but her calling was to bear and raise the Son of God as well as a couple of his disciples. Not one of the twelve, but she raised up James, who wrote the book of James. She raised up Jude, who wrote the book of Jude. But it's not on you to, to somehow figure it out by self-analysis. Self-analysis rarely ends well because then all you're thinking about is yourself, which is kind of the opposite of what Jesus calls us to do. Mm -hmm. You ever been uh, analyzing yourself and you saw a mess? Oh, my goodness, and self went out the window and you went over to... That, that's often how Jesus works with us. Uh, a verse we've been mentioning a lot these days is Romans 11:29 says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. In other words, no matter what you did in your life, you have not blown your calling. You're still breathing. You're still here. And if you are pursuing the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you're, you may be knee-deep in your calling doing what God wants you to do, and, and you have no idea because you're just enjoying it. and You feel like, this is just who I am. Sometimes you'll, you're like tired and then something along the lines of your calling comes up and you're like, ooh, and you go there and you, you dive in and you help with however God has called you to help. And at the end of the time, you flop in a chair and you're like, that was awesome. <laughs> you're not like, oh, I can't believe I had to do that again. No, that's not your calling. You go to bed and it's a good kind of tired. So... The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. It's in there. 
and each and every one of us, he has empowered and equipped us in a unique way to pursue his calling, or he is in the middle of empowering and equipping you right now to live out your calling. So how can you figure out your calling? I, I wish I could give you just three quick bullet points and you go home and do it this week and you come back and say, okay, I know my calling. <laughs> how can you figure it out? Well, here's an important first step. Colossians 3.17 says this, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In other words, if you're a teacher, impact these kids out of respect and love for Jesus. If you're a nurse, work bandaging the grateful and the ungrateful with the compassion of God. Whatever, whatever he calls you to do, you can do that to his glory. Something very impactful for us once, the uh, singles group from First Baptist came and just wanted to go through our church, do a lot of deep cleaning and fixing and things like that. And this one woman was polishing the wood of the piano, and the whole time she's praying, Oh Lord, bless this instrument as it leads into the worship of you and the praise of you. Bless the hands that play this. It, she did it as an act of worship, polishing the piano to the glory of God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, and then see what unfolds. Many of us stumble into our calling. After uh, we're all the way in the midst of it, we're like, oh, hey, I think this is what God wanted me to do in the first place. Let me give you an example from my own life. As I pursued God, his call to ministry unfolded. And then we were approached and asked if we would, Paula and I were approached and asked if we would be interested in planting a new church in another part of town, which is a nightmare for an introvert. Usually you want entrepreneurial go-getter types, and I knew that. <laughs> and my response was, yeah, I need that like I need a bullet in the head. Yeah, thank you very much. But, you know, ministry, I should probably pray before I flat out turn it down. And the more I prayed, I thought, oh, man, this is what God, what are you thinking? <laughs> I think he's thinking my ego's not going to get in the way because I have no idea what I'm doing. But the more I prayed about it, the more Luke 4, 18 and 19 came up. And it was just kind of burned into my soul. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It was etched into my soul, and I had no idea how to do that. No idea at all. But I wanted to do that. I had no experience. We started Crosstown, and God started bringing people in. People very different than I had ever worked with before. And some came in, I thought, oh, they look like they need Jesus. And some people came in, I said, Jesus, don't let them hurt us. <laughs> and God started giving me experiences. Because God knows you learn much more from experience than you do from a book. And then just one day I realized that God had anointed me to preach good news to the poor because he gave me opportunities to do it and it wasn't awkward I, I genuinely wanted to share with them the reason for the hope that I have and the assurance that God loves them no matter what their life situation is and I'm stunned how I've gotten good at it because I, I again I'm more of an introvert I overanalyze things and it's like I want you to talk to them about the love of God and it's like Oh no, how am I, what's the best sales pitch I got? I do much better when I sit next to a stranger and they look at me like, you must be a pastor. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> and talk to them about what's going on in their life and God starts to show me 
how he is looking out for them and then I can point it out to them and give them hope, give them peace, give them joy. And it, it's just stunning to me what God has done. A few nights ago I was driving home, sun's going down, it's starting to get dark and there's a woman sitting in the road. And I thought, man, she's going to get hit. I stopped, I asked her a few questions. She couldn't walk without assistance. She said somebody took her walker. I don't know if she was under the influence of something or not. I uh, helped her to the sidewalk where she could sit down safely and then called her an ambulance. I, years ago, I never would have done that. I would have overanalyzed it. I would have driven, okay, I should pull over and help her. It's getting dark. I wonder if it's a setup. Who's lurking behind the trees? And I don't know what to do. And what if she's sick? Or, you know, and, and uh, Jesus, take care of her. I'm going home where it's warm and safe. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have done that, and I wouldn't have known how to do it. I would have been afraid or just not know what to do. And you know how I've learned to do that? You guys taught me. God taught me through you. There is so much that I do now that when we started Crosstown, I had no idea. But Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. In other words, even if you have no idea how to do the right thing, but you want to do it, you are blessed. And God is more than capable of teaching you how to do it. You guys have taught me how to do... I, I just... You've taught me so much. And, and just pastoring here has really taught me everything I do. And I, I'm so blessed by it because I, if I read this stuff in a book, I wouldn't have known what, how to do with it. God knows you can't open a book and smell the situation. <laughs> right? <laughs> and... Uh, God has used all of you to bring out my calling and teach me how to do it. And I'm so incredibly grateful. Grateful for everybody who has come here. Let me shift gears a little bit to help you visualize your calling. Let me give you a little bit of brain science here. <laughs> when you remember things, you don't remember in a steady timeline. I... I don't know how many of you were, when you think back to high school, it seems about 10 years long. <laughs> and then the four years after high school is just a little blip on the radar. Well, high school is very eventful, right? You got sports you go to, you surrounded by hundreds of friends for the most part. Uh, it, it's very, a very eventful sequence event. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> it's a very eventful time. And your mind remembers events. Your memories go from event to event to event. And if you have several days that are uneventful, you don't really remember much unless you were praying desperately for a few days that were uneventful, then that, that's kind of a, a vacation at home. But your mind remembers events. Something else the Lord has taught me is that music is an event. When you hear a song, there's a beginning to the song and there's an ending to the song, and it's an experience that you have. Music is an event experienced in a moment in time. And, and it's almost like if you looked at your life on a timeline, you hit this particular day and the memories go way up here. There's all kinds of of memories, eventful memories from that moment, and then the timeline goes. And really, in the, in the presence of God, those instances can go for eternity. And when you give yourself to the music, it takes, your, it takes you somewhere else, doesn't it? I mean, some of you, you have certain songs, and when it comes on, you crank it up, and suddenly you are reliving an event 
in the time of your life. You were taken back there. You ever been listening to a, a song that does that, and then when it's over, you're driving, you're like, wait, where am I? <laughs> right? Because your mind was somewhere else. Yeah, and luckily your subconscious is still avoiding pedestrians and such. I, I, um, I, I've been listening to some orchestra music and I was watching a YouTube video of this orchestra play it and there were these uh, women sitting in the front playing violins and cellos and they had no music in front of them and, and you could see them close their eyes as they played this they were just living the music and even it, it went to the drummer and he's just like gazing up to heaven playing the drums it, it was an event for these people it wasn't a job and it was like it was taking them somewhere else. When you are in the music event, you experience more than what's just going on around you. And the memories of that music event embed deeply in your soul. One time I, I went and spoke at a youth camp for a week in Oregon, and they would sing this one particular song throughout the week that I'd never heard before and and it, it just overwhelmed me every time I heard it and when the camp was done <clears throat> I was actually grieving leaving that song because I, I it was overwhelming what we had seen God do in the camp and that song kind of embodied the entire experience and and uh, Paula and uh, two of our three boys, the youngest wasn't born yet, they flew up to meet me in Oregon and then we went to visit her brother. And when and, and we go into the church and to be honest, I'm like, Lord, I'm already grieving what I've left up in the mountains. And we sit down in his church and they start worship and they sing that same song. And it all came flooding back. And just worship and praise to God that he is the God of the mountains and the valleys. It's amazing how music will help you relive a part of that event again. When you are in worship of God, it's an event of experiencing the presence of God. And it's like... When you hear that song again on the radio or you're playing it again, it, it's like walking past a garden and it smells like grandma's house or, or smells, it, it, the smells bring back the good memories. The songs help you relive that event again. When you are in an experience of the presence of God, time becomes distorted and irrelevant. All you know is I am my beloved's and he is mine. When you hear that same worship music later, it carries your heart back to that moment. That's why we have a favorite playlist, right? Okay, I don't actually, but I burn CDs. <laughs> <laughs> but you experience a part of that event again, just as we read in scripture where it says, uh, Mary pondered these things and treasured them in her heart. She would have some downtime and she would just sit back and think, Remember when all those smelly, dirty shepherds came running up? <laughs> Affirming once again that I get to be the mother of the Son of God. And was able to relive that moment again. Well, let me tell you something about you. Part of the way scripture refers to you is the redeemed. In other words, you were captive to Satan and Jesus paid the price to set you free. That's what we mean when we are redeemed. The redeemed, you, are a son of God. Mm -hmm. Each person redeemed by God embodies an event. I mean... I. I can't stand up here and look at you as just a, a crowd. I, I can't help but look at you, and when I look at you, I see some of your life events. 
And, and it's like hearing and, and reliving a song of beauty all over again. When you know somebody's story, you can't help but replay it in your mind each time you see them. And you see the beauty of God's creative work in them, and their very presence can lead you back into worship again. You are a love song of God. And the Lord is singing to us today. Now some of you, your song is still being written. Actually, I'm pretty sure if you're still alive and breathing, your song is still being written. Because some of you may be like, my life just feels like a disaster. I, I don't know what the future holds or if I'm even going to make it. Well, I remember those days myself. And yet here I am. So if God's willing to do that for me, I'm sure he's willing to do that for you also. You are a song of God. And the Lord is singing it to us. Many of you, your song is still being written, but take, understand this, it is being written. And it will be beautiful. So what does all this have to do with your life's purpose? A verse we quote a lot of times is Revelation 12, 11. It says that God's people triumphed over the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Right? The power of the blood of Jesus shed for us, <clears throat> setting us free so that we could receive the gift of the Holy <clears throat> Spirit and your song, your testimony. Your testimony shatters the lie of the devil that there's no way out, that people feel trapped in. You know what? That's right in alignment with 1 John 3, 8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And your story, your song, is another song that destroys the works of the devil. I remember seeing a meme. It said, yeah, Taylor Swift's boyfriend breaks up with her, and she goes, oh, okay, I'll just make another million dollars, right? <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> The devil tried to destroy you, and you embraced Jesus, knowing that by the blood of the Lamb, your sins are forgiven, and he took you out of your brokenness and has brought something beautiful into your life. That destroys the works of the devil. You are in alignment with the purpose of Jesus. He's using your song to do it. And then there's another level to this that God wants to do. You can listen to others and help draw out their song. You can listen to others, and if you're praying in your mind while you're hearing their story, you can just say, Holy Spirit, open my eyes to what you're doing in this person's life. And it is stunning how you can talk to anybody out there and if you have the heart of Jesus listening to them, God will start to reveal what he's been doing in their life, and they have no idea. Until you say something like, isn't that amazing how God carried you through that time? And it causes them to step back. I've heard people literally say, hey, you're right. And they start to see the beauty of the love of God. You can help them learn their song. What is your life's purpose? Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love people. Not just the nice people. Not just the people who are like you. To love all people. And when you do... You just might find yourself singing their song. You ever heard that? Somebody said, oh, he came home and he's been singing his praises all day long. 
Well, you didn't walk in at Crosstown today. <laughs> Some of you are grateful to God I stopped there. <laughs> but when we talk about, oh, it was amazing, and they did this, and they did that, well, we refer to that as, oh, they were singing their praises, right? Because you are a love song from God. And I got to tell you, I find so often that when I go somewhere and somebody says, how's the church going? I zoom in on one of you all and I share the latest thing we've seen God do. And I've heard the room go quiet and people not in the conversation stop <laughs> to listen. I used to be the night janitor at First Baptist, which worked out well because I'm a night owl. But it was like massive amounts of housework. I'd go, I'd get the note, mop the gymnasium. Uh. <laughs> right? And so in the summer, they'd have the upper windows open. And I didn't like having the lights on because I didn't like the thought that people could look in at me and I couldn't see who they are. It's nighttime in Stockton, right? So I wouldn't turn the lights on. There was enough light from the exit lights and such that I could see. And one of the joys of mopping the gymnasium is you can sing in harmony with yourself. <laughs> There's so much echo. <laughs> and, and, you know, where else except in a movie do you people sing and there's a cool background echo. And stuff like that. So one night I'm in there and as far as I know, I'm the only one around and I am just singing hymns at the top of my lungs. Just singing about the goodness of God, enjoying the reverberation. And I didn't know they had a deacon board meeting in the next building. <laughs> And they had their windows open because it was a warm night. And in the middle of their meeting, they're just like, they just stopped. <laughs> and there's this echoey praises of God coming from the night sky, you know. They figured it out it was me. But they didn't resume their meeting. They just sat there and listened to the distant praises of God echoing. You are a song. People have been singing your song in various places. And God has anointed you to help others draw their song out also. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed you for something. His gifts and His calling on you are irrevocable. He's you can't take a gift back. It's a gift. You won't take them away. And if you follow your calling, it will bring goodness and beauty into our world, which will destroy the works of the devil. You can start by just whatever you do, in word and deed. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Heavenly Father, I thank you for filling this church with your song. Lord, I thank you for the life events that you have carried us through. And Lord, the things that we thought were going to destroy us, you have taken that chaos and created goodness and beauty through it. Lord, I thank you that our church family is not monotone. We are not just all one story. But Lord, we are a marvelous symphony of life events poured out by you. And so Lord, we look to you and ask, what else is out there and what do you want me to do about it? Lord, some of us have been called to speak to the poor. Some of us have been called to bring color, splash color and beauty on everything that we do. Some you have gifted with the ability to take what's broken and burned up and worn out and make it functional again. Lord, there's an infinite number of things that you call people to do, but you also empower and equip us to do it. And we thank you for that. 
Lord, we thank you that at the end of the day of walking with you, we can flop in a chair and say, wow, isn't God good? Thank you for letting me be a part of that today. Lord, we sing your praises because of what you have done. And Lord, we thank you for creating the events of our life, for singing us into existence and singing us through this life. That other stop talking and listening. They start listening because of the beauty that they see in here. Lord, you are good, and you are out to do us good, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.